Welcome to the Press Row. Behind the scenes stories from the world of sports media. Press Row. Inside and interviews from around the sports world. Now here's your host, Jonah Siegel. Jonah here on the Press Row. Happy to have everybody back. Happy New Year. Healthy New Year. Hope everybody's doing well. Super excited to have you here. This is our first episode being recorded in the Google atmosphere. We had never heard of Zoom before, but we all know Google and for a host of different reasons, technically speaking. Uh, happy to have that discussion later on down the road on why we moved over and away from Zoom towards Google. Um, but so much going on. Um, thought it was a good time to bring back an old friend of the show, a former guest, Nick Kiprios. We talk about a ton today. Leafs, uh, Connor Bedard, um, trade deadline, Brendan Shanahan, Kyle Dubas. So much to talk about, so much to listen to. Hope you are as entertained as I was, uh, either before, after, or during NFL playoffs, Raptor trades, so much going on. Sit back, relax, and enjoy today's episode of In the Press Row with Nick Kiprios. Welcome back in the Press Row. Jonah Siegel here in Seattle. It is uh, NFL Playoff Saturday. Finally. It's also NHL Hockey Saturday, but it is NHL Playoff Saturday. Super stoked to be here. Um, it's an exciting Saturday. My, we have a return guest. Uh, I will bring him on right now. Live from, I'm going to guess, either his office or his basement, for those of you not on YouTube. Because <laughs> all podcasters are in their basements. Uh, but he's not a podcaster or a blogger. He is from Sportsnet 590, the Nick Kiprios, the Kipper and Born Show, the real Kipper, Nick Kiprios. Nick, how are you? John, good, buddy. How are you? Thanks awesome. for having me. So this is a, uh, a, a special show for us today, Nick. Uh, we have made the switch from the world of Zoom over to the world of Google. Yeah. Um, everyone, no one really had heard of Zoom pre-pandemic, and uh, for a whole host of technical reasons we've now made the pivot over to zoom uh i'm noticing the fidelity is much better hoping the quality is good but how are things with you how are your family what's new and exciting well uh everything's great thanks for asking uh life just gets quicker and quicker and i know we just briefly had a touch of a, a conversation on that uh, just prior to coming on uh and doing your show uh but it's fast and i'm just i'm paddling like hell um, and that's basically what it is. Uh, above water, you want to look calm, cool, and collected, as they say about the duck. But underneath, you're you're moving your feet as fast as you can. And it's been it's been good, but it's been a more controlled environment for me. Uh, meaning that uh, I am back with Sportsnet. Uh, we do have a national show from from uh, from five to six right across the country on uh, on the major platform at Sportsnet. But it's not as hectic to the to the pace that I had prior uh, uh, leaving Sportsnet in 2019 temporarily. Uh, that one included, of course, Hockey Night in Canada and uh, and countless of nights uh, to working uh, long hours. But this one seems a little bit more uh, controlled, and uh, I'm enjoying uh, every second of it with, uh, with Justin Bourne and Sammy McKee uh, on our daily uh, program. It is uh, absolutely critical in my opinion, and we've talked about this before, that there is variety in the marketplace for the audience. I'm not going to say the fan because that's in your company name, but it, it is like th there's good competition now. There's two shows well, there's multiple shows, but there's two shows that are on terrestrial radio. And then for idiots like me that stream all <laughs> the time, um, th there's lots of competition. And it's good to have a variety of shows and variety of guests. Explain, you know, tell us how you, you've evolved. If we talked about your show previous to this year, it was clearly Maple Leaf centric. You did a lot of Leaf talk. It feels like this year it has evolved a little bit. You're still Leaf heavy, but you've certainly evolved beyond just that. Yeah, no question about that. Uh, you know, again, uh, Sportsnet, the Fan 590, made a pivot uh, to really focus uh, on 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 local. So uh, you know, they developed. Uh, a Raptor show uh, that's been terrific. Uh, Will's done an amazing job there. Um, Alex, uh, the guys, Murph now, uh, just 
if you're a Raptor fan, you know where to go. And uh, they they originally three years ago did the same thing for myself, Justin Bourne and Sammy McKee, where it was just, hey, uh, we're local and let's do the Toronto Maple Leafs for an hour. And we did that for two years and uh, it was very popular. And just in terms of, uh, again, I mean, we have different shows out there. You mentioned the competitors, but where do you draw the line on 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 10 minutes of the Leafs, 20 minutes of the Leafs, and then moving on to other subjects? We said, no, we're going to go one full hour on the Toronto Maple Leafs. And, and uh, the fans loved it. Uh, and that was great. Going into our third year, they did not want to take that away. So uh, we've gone from now... Uh, uh, the hours from three to five to four to six uh, with the decision from five to six to go national. And of course um, you can't do that on just the Toronto Maple Leafs alone. So in that second hour uh, we, we kind of blanket the the country and, and the rest of the league for that matter. And just the other day we, uh, uh, we had Ian McIntyre on for the first 20, 25 minutes uh in our five o'clock national segment, uh, talking Vancouver Canucks, which may, you know, I don't think anybody's arguing that's the, been the biggest story in the National Hockey League. This turnaround and recently now uh, re-upping Jimmy Rutherford, and we didn't really see uh, a future in that this time, <laughs> probably last year, with the decision of uh, Bruce Boudreau, no Bruce Boudreau, fire him, don't fire him. It was a it was a train wreck last year. The turnaround's been phenomenal. So just to bring it back to, to how we've handled it, we, we we spent the first 25 minutes. And of course, we're in Vancouver market. We're in Calgary's market. So it's very important for us that we touch on those big stories, uh, you know, when, when they present. So uh, it's been fun. Uh, it's been a, a fast paced two hours. You know, uh, Jonah, when, when I started this show, I was like, I, can I can I talk for two hours? I'm gonna run out of things to say, and I, I worried about that. And uh, you know, from day one, I'm like, I don't think we got everything in. I I thought we would, and uh, it's it's been so much fun ever since. And you know, we just want to keep it uh, uh, fun, uh, informative, uh, entertaining, whatever words you want to say to describe it. We just want to bring out the best of. Uh, of our personalities over the course of two hours. And I can't tell you how much fun I'm having on that show. Well, isn't that what it's all about? Is that, you know, you, you played a game that you loved, you made a career out of it, you made a living out of it. And yet now here you are X number of years later and you found a way to have fun in your second career. I mean, isn't that what you teach your kids? It is. And I, I'll tell you something too. And I'm perfectly honest with anybody that asks me, uh, you know, when you compare TV to what we're doing today and it's just night and day, uh, TV is a different beast. It's, it's a short sprint where you got to get your thoughts out quickly. And, you know, when you're in a panel and you only got three minutes, like if you told me Sammy McKee and, and Justin board, we all had three minutes to, to say what we, what we needed to say and then move on. It, it would be impossible. Absolutely impossible but this form now for me gives me the best opportunity for people to truly get to know me television in 20 years never did that and right now uh from your show to my show to anything in between it's just about the viewer the listener feeling like they're getting the real deal they're getting you that you're you're authentic uh and and you would sound no different if the cameras or the microphones were off. And that's why there's so much success now in the podcast world is because you're getting, you're getting raw, sometimes authentic reaction from, from personalities that are, are still very difficult to get through in a short span on television. And uh, I, I truly feel like in the last three years, people have gotten to know me more, uh, since I've started this uh, new venture than at any point over 20 years of my career. And Nick, how much more fun would your show with Doug have been? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm being serious. Um, you know, no, no, I, hang on, no, 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 yeah. hang on, let me finish. Sure. Forget the cameras. If you just had, if, if radio had evolved into streaming audio now, yeah, where you weren't cut down into the segments yeah. that you're cut down now, yeah. Yeah. Listen, um, 
You know, there was a there was a window there with Hockey Central at noon uh, with myself, Doug, and and uh, and Darren Millard, of course. Yeah. Good old what's his name? Oh, you know what? What's he's, his name in La- What's his name in Las Vegas? He, he's he's in Vegas now. He's gone on to Stanley Cup championships. And I'm uh, a Darren Millard fan. I'm just having fun with you. You know, I mean, uh, he's he's uh, he, you know he's hanging out with all the yeah. the big stars. Uh, That's right. So uh, every once in a while, I have to remember. Uh, but we, we, we were on the cusp of something there, which was ahead of our time a little bit. No, no. And, I just mean, I just yeah, mean the, I just yeah. mean the format, the format yeah, no, no, has no. changed because as with television, radio yes. two was very, you've got news, you've got updates, you've got traffic Yeah. in what, yeah. in your show now, yeah. it's yeah. much more even flow, Nick. It is, but we, I mean. we, we were, we were scratching the surface on, on people coming to us and feeling like, uh, we're a little bit more relaxed. We're a little bit more uh, conversationless instead of those, uh, those snippets of, okay, we're going to talk about the power play and you're going to go first and then you're going to go and then right. you're going to go. And it's like, uh, it's like, uh, that old, uh, I love Lucy and I know I'm dating myself, but where you got the, the conveyor right. belt, yes. and she's trying uh-huh. to wrap the chocolates. <laughs> That's the way television for the most part has been on a panel. And but- you know, still today you watch some, some segments and you're like, ah, that's not doing it for me right now. Uh, but but we, we were, we, we had something going and it, it evolved into the podcast world. We were, I'll say this to anybody, uh, D- it, Darren Millard, Doug McLean and myself on hockey central at noon, uh, was really, uh, the start of spit and chicklets before spit and chicklets was spit and chicklets. Yeah. My only point, Nick, is that radio has evolved and benefited from podcasting because it has lost that same formality that TV yeah. also had. That's all. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> for sure. And like, like even when I first started three years ago, it was, it was to be presented as a podcast. We would go the first 45 minutes, uh, three years ago without a commercial break. That That's was, my point. That was unheard of. That's my point. So, so to this day, I, I know, I know we're on different, platforms as you are now with your youtube channel and, and right. downloadings and all of that but we'd still present as a podcast we're on national television now on, on Sportsnet, but uh nothing about it suggests that uh we're on tv we have no cameramen we really have no direction in terms of hitting breaks mm-hmm. or sometimes we can if we have a hot topic w- they're saying go with go it. We'll, just we'll, go we'll, Right. We'll, we'll we'll break somewhere else down the road here. So uh, again, there's no turning back. Uh, we are in this world of uh, of podcasts, and uh, first and foremost, that's the way we see our show. All right. So you said something very interesting. Vancouver Canucks, just down the highway or up the highway from where I am. Yeah. Uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs are there tonight. If ever there was an a, an example, a case study. That coaching matters in the National Hockey League, at least right now, it is that. And uh, a certain somebody's on the hot seat right now as his team is um, struggling. Has it ever been more evident to you, Nick, that coaching really makes a difference in the National Hockey League if you have the right guy? Yeah, when I, when I was uh, 17, I would tell you that uh, the, the main person purpose of a coach was to open up the gate and and let us play and now i'm 57 and uh he is the general he's the one that sets the tone he's the one that uh makes you believe in 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 certain ways and uh when he doesn't believe in you he's got to find different ways to to squeeze it out of you and i've known what's changed what's changed you or what's changed have you matured is your viewpoint changed or is the game changed No, no, no. My viewpoint, I don't think it's been any different in any era. And I know sometimes uh, we can look back and and say, yeah, that the players have changed. And we were, we were a lot scareder of our head coach. We were a lot scareder of, of consequence and repercussions for, for doing stuff out on the ice, like throwing a pizza up the middle of the ice and having it come back and, and end up in your own net. I mean, that stuff I knew that I, I, I'm pretty well could have been done the rest of the night that I wasn't going to get another shift. 
And today, I think it's a little differently, but uh, that's where you got a guy like Rick Tockett, uh, who you know isn't from the '60s or '70s. He's from the '90s. But you know, today kids would look at uh, our existence in the '90s and think of it like we thought of it in the '50s. So I, I get all of that. But uh, you know, Rick's old school, but he's not old school enough to find uh, to be smart enough to say that there's different different means or ways to get the same message across that I had when I played, that there are consequences, there are repercussions. And he's just been better at it than other coaches. And we've heard Sheldon Keefe also, you know, I, particularly in the last two or three weeks, talk about accountability, like really talking about it, where that word's come out um, multiple times. And the next thing you know, we've seen uh, uh, David Camp. Uh, a healthy scratch or John Tavares play two minutes in the third period as we saw last week. So uh, now uh, is, is this a good time now to get that message across to turn around the Toronto Maple Leafs or, or is it uh, maybe a little too late with now half the season uh, gone already? We'll, we'll have to see how this plays out, but the Leafs aren't as bad as they portrayed the last little while. And in, in their best days this season, they were never as good. But uh, that's for Sheldon now to see how much he can squeeze out of them. But there's no question when it comes to maybe Rick Tockett or even Rick Bonus. And I know Rick took a leave of absence for a little while, but it really stems for his calling out of the hockey club at the end of last season for accountability and, and stepping up. Uh, these are hard messages for kids of today to, to listen to. But so far, both those hockey clubs have had tremendous responses. Hard to argue with a coaching change in Edmonton then, Rel. Yeah. Um, uh, listen, uh, you go 21 and six, I think, since Knobloch came in. And uh, how do you how do you say that that wasn't a great decision, a right decision? The one thing that, uh, you know, you got to remember, too, is, is despite, uh, you know, that horrific start of the season. And I'm, listen, I, I'm, I'm, since I've been working with Justin Bourne, he has taught me more about analytics. Um, we sometimes have a segment uh, where it's like he'll throw out all these numbers to me and I'll go useful or useless. <laughs> uh huh. And I've never spent more time trying to decide what side I'm on on the numbers. But there were some really good, hard evidence for the Edmonton Oilers, despite their start, that they were trending in the right direction and it was only a matter of time before it was going to turn a little bit for them so in that area i believe uh that was 100 percent true that uh better goaltending better decisions and this thing had a chance to really turn the other way um some other clubs can't say that for sure uh, but knoblox seems to have the right temperament the right calmness uh, for that particular market at that particular time. And then a big equation in all of this is Paul Coffey, the ability to come in and and be Paul Coffey, one of the greatest defensemen in the history of the game, and uh, and go up to a Darnell nurse and say, okay, it's okay to make a mistake. We want to limit them, and we want to get you in a mindset where you start playing the percentages of your decisions, which one's high risk and which one's low risk. If we can start uh, making better decisions, uh, you're going to be a better defenseman and we're going to start climbing up the ladder. And I think he's done that with uh, Nurse and uh, Bouchard. I don't think Bouchard will ever win a Norris based on the way he uh, he uh, he looks in his own zone, but he still has the ability to put 60 points, 70 points, maybe score 20 goals in the league. And uh, uh, those players don't come by very often. And Skinner's been... So much better now that, uh, you know, that, uh, that Skinner, uh, you know, uh, situation uh, has been cleaned up with uh, uh, Campbell now out of the picture. So you've got contemporaries in management positions now, and it's absolutely every sport is a copycat. Everyone says our game's a copycat game. All games are copycat games. How many of your buddies do you think have itchy trigger fingers on their coaches as a result of a couple of yeah. teams who've made changes and, and not only not just your contemporaries, their bosses. 
the owners are going, what the hell? What, what yeah. are we doing here? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, uh, it's, it's the, I don't want to say the easiest decision because it's never an easy decision, but it's the one that can jolt your hockey club now uh, faster than anything else because of the lack of trades, the salary cap, like it's only cash for those guys. So it doesn't go against the salary cap uh, and you can bring somebody else, pay them whatever you want. And it doesn't affect you in any other way other than uh, coming into the dress room and, and having a new leader. So it is in many ways, uh, the maybe one of the first places now uh, owners will look because they understand that I can't trade this guy. I can't trade this guy. I'm locked into this guy. This guy has a no move. I want to move him, but I can't. There are no move uh, clauses yeah, for coaches. So uh, it, it, is, it is an easier place to start. And, you know, the one thing that is consistent, though, when you fire a coach in any era at any time, Jonah, is that uh, as, as a as a general manager or, or a president, uh, as long as you hold that, that card, it, it, you, you, you gotta be careful on how early you want to go to it, because if it doesn't work out, you know, you know, the next, uh, focal point will now be on you. So, you know, whether you feel that way about the Leafs or, you know, LA struggling now and Todd McClellan's there and he's been around a long time. And he's also now in a position where people may be looking at, Hey, what's wrong with the LA Kings? Is it coaching? But once you pull that trigger and it doesn't work, then the next set of eyeballs will be uh, higher up than the coach. And, and that sometimes uh, uh, plays into decision-making on not if you sometimes do it when you do it. Speaking of higher up in the hierarchy, last summer was one of the most interesting and bizarre scenarios I think either of us have ever seen in any sport play out. The poker game between Kyle Dubas and Brendan yeah. Shanahan. Uh, that was that was like reality television at its finest. Yeah, the curtains were were open and we got to watch. Yeah. So you've had some time to let things brew. To still, I have I have two questions. First off, how much damage to the organization from a timing perspective was done? Like that really sucked. Like, forget how good you think Tree Living is or the job that he's done from a timing perspective. He was put like no matter they could have bought in the greatest GM of all time from a timing perspective hands were tied behind the back pretty closely weren't they that's question one and then question two what the bleep do you think really happened okay um let's uh let's answer the second question first what really happened was a power play between kyle dubas and brendan shanahan that's all and it's not it's not anything we haven't seen before behind the scenes. This one got played out in front of us, as you said, in real time. Uh, uh, but this was just a negotiation at the end of the day. That's all it was, is a guy who needed a new contract that, uh, that came up with uh, a set of terms that were not met by Brendan Shanahan and, and, and the board. So you move on. Was and, it, hang on, hang on, hang on. Was it, it, so was it lack of trust, lack of faith, dislike? Uh, I wanted more power. I didn't want you uh, to have to run every thought and idea I had um, to the board or to yourself. I want to be in a position where I can make these decisions Autonomously. And, I can, and I can do them quickly. Uh, on top of the dollars. So, I mean, there's a few boxes Kyle wanted to check off to move forward as a Toronto Maple Leafs and Brendan didn't meet them. That's all it was. And that's, again, that's not any different than, than what Jimmy Rutherford went through the other day with uh, Aquilini, right? Yep. Here, here, here's, I want to sign a new three-year deal. Okay, this is what I need. Aquilini goes, check, check, check. Let's have a press conference. Uh, that's all. Do you think Shanahan made the right move? And we'll come back to my my first my first question in a minute. 
knowing what we know, did, did Brendan make yeah. the right move saying, I can't live, Brendan or the board, whoever you think made the decision saying, I can't live with this? There's no question that Brendan did the best, made the best decision for Brendan Shanahan. Like, I'm the president. You're telling me that you were what, you, like, what are you asking, Kyle? That we be co presidents now? That, uh, that I'm not your boss? That you report to someone at the board now? That's cutting me off at the knees here. Like, I'm the president here. You're the general manager. So, absolutely, he made the right decision for Brendan. But what about for the Maple Leafs? That, that's a that's a different conversation though that is a different conversation we're having if you're asking me at this point does does brendan shanahan deserve to be running the toronto maple leafs has he done enough to keep going no that, no my my question is conversation. no no we, we'll get there my first question is brendan brendan shanahan's number one job yeah is to, is to bring a parade lewicki yeah. style to the toronto maple leafs yeah did he do that in letting Kyle Dubas go or firing him, essentially? I, I am I am a belief that there was strong evidence to suggest that Kyle should have been fired a year ago before okay. that. So if you're asking me, uh, do I believe that the Leafs would be in better shape right now if Kyle stayed and had more autonomy? 100% no, in okay. my opinion. Thank you. Okay. That wasn't so difficult. No, not at all. <laughs> but, you know, there's just different ways to get to the same That's answer, right. right? Okay. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, again, I I don't know where where the conversation wants to go, but uh, look at the look at what he left Brad Tree living, like. Well, that's question two. Okay. That's that's my all point. you. That's all you need to know is whether or not you, you believe that Kyle Dubas should have stayed and the Leafs would have been in better shape. Look at the shape he left them in. So part of my question then was it's hard to really evaluate tree living. Now he's made some boneheaded mistakes. Then, okay. Hold on for a second. Okay. Yeah. He's missed on a couple. Okay. But under the circumstances, the lack of cash, uh, what Klingberg. Okay. Um, yes, not great, but one year deal, four million. Yeah, that was just like throw it on the the wall. Let's see if it sticks. Uh, Max Domi's been good. One year deal, minimal. Bertuzzi, okay, hasn't been great. Can he still have a back half of the season? He looks more like a top six possibility, but one year deal. These these are deals. They're not they're not killers. They're not no, no. they're not killer uh, bad deals. They're just no. deals that haven't not worked out. That's all. Yeah, my point was, again, he's made some boneheaded moves, but he was pretty handcuffed given time, if nothing else, given timing. This happened to a guy, when did he start, right? Like, this all happened very late, and he had to come in and deal with the Matthews stuff. Yes. It was shitty. Like, let's just yeah. call it what it is. It was really shitty. Oh, no. When the, it's, when the... it's getting shittier, okay? Because right. now... Because now you're at a fork in the road and it's like, okay, are, are we thinking we're in this thing or are we not? And if we're not, uh, or if we are, what do I have to work with here? What am I, what, 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 where are the expectations now? People really believe I'm going to go get two grade A defensemen now to shore up this blue line. Really? Have you take a look at the cupboard and what Kyle Dubas left me with? How am I supposed to do that? Where is my goalie situation? Where is John Tavares as a second line centerman in the back half of the season? There are some major, major um, question marks for Brad Tree living in, in this back half of the season. So I think in the next two weeks, they got to really take a good look in the mirror and say, okay, what are we here? Do we, are we, are we fooling people here to thinking that we can compete this year or else you know, or do we have to make some sound decisions here so we don't completely blow this thing up in the next five or 10 years? So if I were talking to a radio show host and the <laughs> NHL trade deadline came along and the Maple yeah. Leafs stood pat, that would be a ratings bonanza for me. <laughs> no? Um, 
that's i do believe that if you were to uh think that you might even still give up a first round or you got to give it up for for somebody that's going to be around for the next two or three years on the blue line like the days of of the leafs trading for felino or or McKay, well, McCabe, McCabe had a good contract, so I'll exclude him here. But uh, Ryan O'Reilly, to me, was a disaster beyond belief that you would make a trade for a guy like that, uh, bring him home, make him a, a Leaf, a former captain, a Conn Smythe winner, and you had no reassurance he was going to stay with you moving forward on a two- or three-year deal. To me, that that cannot happen at the trade deadline. Those, that, that, those days are over, but if you want to talk about giving up a first-rounder, uh, and, and feeling like Chris Tanev's the guy, you better make sure he's under contract ASAP because uh, the, the damage that uh, that those first and second rounders gone in the last few years, like I said, is uh, is something that can can haunt you for the next five or ten years. So above tree living is an interesting group of characters, starting with Brendan. What's this year? Eight, nine of his tenure? Yeah, they're closing on ten for sure. Um, I said this on our show the other day. You know, he's gone the length of his tenure here with the Leafs on Plan A. He has not yet pivoted to a Plan B, a retool, a reset, uh, a blow up. The only question that that is still out there, depending on what kind of season uh, concludes, is does he get a chance to go back to the board and say, I can still do this, I can still fix this, I got a new plan. Generally, coach or general managers and, and presidents at some point, Jonah, they do get a second chance. I'm wondering where Brendan's is. So if Edward Rogers Jr. called you, as unlikely as that might be. <laughs> uh, very unlikely. And said, Nick, what should we do here? Yeah. Not, not should we hire or fire Brendan? Let's not have that discussion. Yeah. But I think you'd agree that the, the recent signing of 34 – Pretty damn good work. He's the best player in my, probably the best player in my lifetime that they've had. Easily top two or three. They've got him locked up for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Listen. Uh, so, so, so from a pers player perspective, yeah. forget coaching, forget management, forget that. What would Nick Kiprios do to the roster? What? So yeah. what would you do? Well, um, I've, 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 I've had this philosophy the last few years that uh is much like a lot of others and sometimes you know if it uh if it's as noticeable as uh, anything out there it doesn't mean it's the wrong decision um but i've never believed that uh, uh the the core four uh with all the money up front and not not necessarily just uh, whether or not i believe in these guys or not that's again a different conversation but I just never liked all that money into four forwards and limited your back end. I am a believer that you win Stanley Cups from the net on out. Uh, you have to defend. To me, winning Cups means defending. Sheldon, if you've even listened to his comments in the last week, still wants to outgun you. He talks about scoring four or five goals and getting the next goal on two different occasions this last week we've heard from sheldon keith saying it's tough to win two one and i'm <laughs> not of that belief i am of the belief that you can win games two one you can have that mentality that two goals is enough and coincidentally the team i think uh they're uh, or i know they're playing tonight uh won a game the other night against arizona two one they didn't look great they've got tremendous talent we've got uh, Miller, a top scorer, uh, Petey's in the, in the running for an MVP. Quinn Hughes looks like McCarr on, on a lot of nights, but they found a way to win two, one. And 
uh, that's to me is is the missing element for the Leafs is they don't defend. They don't uh, know on a consistent basis where to stand at the right time at the right uh, sp- uh, spot in the most critical time in in the hockey game. Now they closed the door on Calgary uh, the other night, protecting a lead. Can can they bring that into the equation here? Uh, consistently moving for, consistently and just to kind of circle back like morgan riley that blue line muzzin going down muzzin in his heyday was very good for the toronto maple Leafs when he was healthy and he was shutting guys down they have not replaced him nor has there been any money to replace him with so i that 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 would be my suggestion to edward is get a better balance in your roster get a better chance to have a a consistent look. So you were not uh, a finesse player. Mitch Marner, you were not. (laughs) You noticed. (laughs) The other night, lots of controversy. And actually a lot of controversy on this side of the border on the Connor Bedard incident. And I got a lot of calls from friends, older guys and gals saying, back when Nick Kiprios played, that guy that got the snot kicked out of him for hitting Bedard. Yeah. And uh, your old buddy, Luke Richardson, after the game said, hey, that was a clean hit. Yeah. So so what's your take? Should, you know, we don't have the Dave Semenkos anymore yeah. on the roster because you can't. Ryan Reeves isn't, I don't even know where the hell the guy is anymore, but you can't have that type of player anymore. That was... A cleanish hit. Unfortunate. Yeah. You don't want the stars of the game out there. Yeah. Do you quarterbacks get hit? It happens, yeah. right? Like, yeah. We I watched a lot of more college football this year. I watched a lot of NFL football. These guys get hit. It happens. They are the stars yeah. of the game. Are we living in an era where stars do take hits? I mean, there's not a lot of hitting in hockey, but yeah. Well, you're you're not scared to take a run at uh, anyone. And in my era, you were, right? You knew that if you were going to take a run at Gretzky, Gretzky over his career probably had three major hits on him, four. Like it's, like it was like, you know, the Olympics, one every four years. Right. You know, it was like you were petrified because you knew the repercussions. And today, that's not the case. And I get it. It's evolved, and we don't have those type of personalities out there. And and I'm not a believer that you have to fight after a, a big check. Uh, but I am a believer of, of you guys decide, right? Decide whatever you want on how y- you want to react. But no reaction is the worst thing if I was a coach, right? Nothing, apathy or just the maple leaf reaction. Moving on. No response is not acceptable on my hockey clubs. So you guys decide how you want to answer it. If if fighting right away is, then I'd rather have that than nothing. If it's scoring a power play goal, I'd rather have that. If it's nothing. If it's going after their best player on a clean check, I'd rather have that than nothing. If it's a scrum where you tell somebody, I'm going to get you. I don't care if I have, if it's the next shift or I need to, I need to do it next year or the year after you are going to pay for this, whatever it is, it just needs to be something and nothing is unacceptable. That's actually a really good answer. Uh, thank you. I, I could have taken that in a lot of good, a lot of different places, but I think your answer is actually smart. And oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's like, like okay, fighting to me sometimes is is it, and has been over the course of history sometimes really overrated, and that's coming from a guy that did it and twelve hundred penalty minutes. Well, to me, the, the to me the, du- the, the, du- but, the to me the dumbest thing is the staged fight. The game yes. begins. Nothing's those, happened. Yeah. Two and guys the, and, drop the gloves. That's just and then, yeah, with no with no emotion. It That's has I mean. to come with passion and emotion for it to have a substantial uh, effect on your hockey club, right? And the way the Wade Belak articles, the things that I read about the poor guy being 
petrified the night, not being able to sleep the yeah. night before yeah. knowing he was going to have to fight a guy the next night to me is the most ridiculous yeah. thing I've it's, it's awful. And, and I am not anti fighting. Now, if, if a guy goes and hits Steven Stamkos from behind dirty, I want Wade be like to go beat the living pulp. Yeah. Out of him. Yeah. I want that out of the game. Yeah. But that, that stage fight to me yeah. is so stupid. Listen, like people still want to take the one incident that we rarely see in today's game and still blow it up. And uh, I know we had the the interesting thing uh, a few weeks back with uh, Ryan Hartman, um, you know, going after uh, an innocent player and Perfetti in, in Winnipeg to pay uh, the price for a, a hit that had nothing to do with him. And uh, uh, again, um, to me, it's 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 about uh, a message that you're sending that those things are unacceptable and it's up to the players to decide how to do that correct but there is there is emotion in that there is effect in that that not only does, uh, resonates on your bench but your fan base and how they feel about their team and other teams taking liberties and again this is your game. You're on the ice. I'm not on the ice. I'm on my couch at home or I'm in the studio. It's not for me to decide. It's about you guys in that situation to make a decision on what's best for your team, your 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 pride, your emotion, all of it comes into play. And again, if 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 you need to take a number, take a number. If you need to now send a message to say you want to run our best player, I'm going after your best player and just see what that does to a hockey club, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, right? That's all comes into play here on, on who ends up winning a best of seven in game five, six or seven, those things, they, they, they grow. And that's the beauty of our game. It's live and it's played out right in front of us. And, uh, it doesn't have to be a fight right away. Oh, but it cannot be nothing. So I remember I remember vividly hearing the words from the Oshawa Generals, the Philadelphia Flyers select Eric Lindros and him not putting on the jersey. A little ironic when you hear that they have to trade away a guy that doesn't want to be a Philadelphia Flyer. What do you think happened there? Uh, I know uh, there's been so much play on... Uh, and then the emotion of uh, the hockey club and their reaction and so many people, especially in our world where there's bloggers and there's us and everybody else in between. And it's like, it's just not good enough that a guy says, eh, I don't want to play in Philadelphia. We got to find out why. Is that I what think. it is? But I, I can accept that. Do you think yeah. that's what it simple? I, listen, it's that simple. Okay. It's, he does not want to play in Philadelphia. Now you want to go try to find an answer you want to be a conspiracy theorist and 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 uh point the finger at kevin hayes uh and and uh as someone that that poisoned a prospect into not signing there are you kidding me right now you really think that that's the reason that the kid does not want to go to philadelphia because he was so excited when he got drafted but yet kevin hayes told him something different and now he doesn't want to sign that's all we do when we get together is we bitch and complain about why we're not successful on our respected hockey club. This well, coach is screwing me. I don't get enough ice time. This guy doesn't play young players. It happens every day for the last 80 years. But because it didn't work out for Kevin Hayes in Philadelphia, doesn't mean it's not going to work out for somebody else. This was the kid's decision, a family decision. He might, maybe he hate, maybe he hates Tortorella. Maybe he hates Rocky movies. I mean, cheese whatever steaks. the cheese steaks, whatever the case is, if this guy doesn't want to sign, what does it mean in terms of rules and regulations? And when do we need to trade him? How long can we keep him? What's the compensation? All of it just not, oh, uh, our feelings are hurt and we're taking this personally. I, I don't understand uh, the Flyers' reaction to it. The, the man has rights 
And one of those rights is he doesn't have to sign if he doesn't want to. Uh, where this thing kind of got ugly for me, and I'm a big Keith Jones fan, and Daniel Briere's the salt of the earth, but I think uh, I think their overreaction to it really poured gasoline on the fire here. And, you know, this could have been easily uh, uh, a situation where you make the trade for uh, Drysdale and you just say, we got a heck of a defenseman right now. It cost us a, a great prospect and, and you, and you could have easily moved on. Um, you know, and, and to me, it was just a little bit of an overreaction that kind of fed this beast. Trust me when I say this, he's not the first player that doesn't want to sign with a team and he won't be the last. This has happened a lot behind the scenes. And, uh, but this one got played out pu publicly. So pulling a 180, coming back to the Leafs, you said you don't necessarily believe in the core four. Two of them just no, signed. Uh, I, you know, I said that I don't believe in, in the money in four. No, 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 I no, no, I agree. <laughs> I, I, I agree. You didn't name names. I'm going to name names. Yeah. Two of them, two of them just signed long-term yeah. deals with long, no movement clauses. And I will go on the record saying that no movement clauses should not be allowed. It, you should be allowed one per team, maybe, but different conversation. That leaves two. And if yeah. Brad Tree Living, Brendan Shanahan, Edward Rogers are going to do something, well, the other two have expiring contracts coming up. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's only one. There's not two. It's right. Mitch Marner. Can you actually see a world where Matthews is on the Leafs without Marner? Yes. Yeah, I can. And do you think do you think Kyle could have ever seen that world? Or we're now at that place because Listen, Kyle's we're, not there. We're, we're still not sure if Brendan can see that world, right? Because, listen, Brendan's the man in charge here. He has to stamp on every As the president, these are your signings. They are your no-movement clause. So it's up to Brendan now to decide if this thing goes south the rest of the season. Uh, and, he's, and he's still the guy moving forward here. How do I how do I change it up? How, where do I go? Who's got the most value? It's not even close right now. Who could bring a boatload back for you? It's Mitch Marner, and just look no further than the Winnipeg Jets. Pierre Luc Dubois on a on a a year that he's going to become a a free agent brings back significant pieces that made them so much stronger, and. He and, and Marner's way better than Pierre Luc Dubois, so it's not hard to figure out if you really want to change things up. Mitch Marner's the only one that can do it for you. It has been said to me by no, many smart people in the Toronto community that the Kyle Dubas divorce would not have played out the way it played out if a Keith Pelly had been in place at the time. Keith Pelly is now in place. Well, he's not there yet. But yeah, he's been hired. Do you think that changes things for Brendan Shanahan? One hundred percent, and it changes it for Masai and on the Raptors. One hundred percent. They've got a new boss now. And what effect do you think that has on your previous comment? Uh, I, I I think uh, again. Uh, Depending on how this season plays out, that's where Keith Pelly comes in and 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 runs a, an analysis on on this season, three seasons ago, five seasons ago. I mean he he goes through he goes through the last run of Brendan Shanahan and he has to decide if Brendan's the guy moving forward or not. That's what I mean, that's what that's what happens. To, that's if what I, will happen if. If uh, if the Leafs go quietly this season, but isn't what you're saying? And I, and I happen to agree with you, by the way. They have 15 regular time wins right now. Is that right? 14, 15 regular? Uh, probably 16 with the Calgary game. Okay, I thought it was 14. Then plus one is 15. But you might be better. Whatever. It yeah. ain't a lot. It's not much. If we agree, oh, no, you know, I think you're right. I think yeah, I think they were at 13, maybe right. 14, whatever. We're whatever. in the ballpark. Whatever. It's somewhere between, it's either 15 or 16. <laughs> it ain't good. We'll agree yeah. that it's not, it's not impressive. 
Yeah, we, um, we, know, we know it's more, cl it's closer to Ottawa and Montreal than it is Boston and correct. Florida. How's it's that? Not, how, it's not elite. For a team that should be elite, it's not elite. And if we agree that Tree Living is sitting there going, wait a minute, I'm not about to put all my chips into the trade deadline because I don't believe. Aren't our expectations already set for what this season? Like, our goaltending is a mess. This is him, them speaking. Like, their goaltending is a mess. Wall may or may not come back and be the, the next coming. But whatever. The, the only reason they have what they have is that the current third goalie has stood on his head. Yeah. Without that move, it's a bleeping disaster. But you get what you get, so fine. But how much does this season results really matter if the GM is already saying, slow down your expectations boys i'm not ready to go all in i want to see if these guys yeah. actually have it um yeah i think as a as brad tree living moving forward if he's got the attitude that he may not push his chips in at the trade deadline as you're suggesting then the scenario in brad's head is what are the consequences to a quiet season this year right yep and and th that goes with brendan shanahan too so now we've got a new boss coming in april right and i think there's going to the, 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 there needs to be at least a couple of conversations i think between brendan and keith or 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 brad and and Brendan to say, you know, if we go down this path, are are we okay moving forward here? Because we've seen in the past, Jonah, where where uh, where general managers have pushed chips into a trade deadline, knowing I'm out of here if it doesn't work. I don't yeah. care what the next guy is looking at in three or four years because i'm not going to be here anyways right and that's factual so where is brendan and brad in their mentality of are, 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 are we trying to save our jobs here or do we have jobs if we if we don't push all our chips in so i, I don't know how they decide but they probably need to answer that question for themselves on 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 what the outcome is if brand if brendan shanahan feels like he's got job security then it might be a different picture on on what type of action lee fans can expect at the trade deadline how's that all right that's great in nick kiprios's mind is brendan shanahan a job security guy uh i'd say uh I don't think anybody should feel safe with uh, a new uh, CEO coming in and, and Keith Pelly. I'm going to ask the question again. Is the Brendan Shanahan that you know yeah. the type of guy who worries about that or is worried about that nearly 10 years in? Uh, no. No. He's not. Okay. Brendan Shanahan uh, is a very confident guy and he's made a lot of money and I don't think you'll ever paint a, a Brendan Shanahan in a corner. Right. And tree living, I would imagine, is probably equally as confident in his own abilities and situation, given he was not out at work for very long. And if he got gonged here, he's got a lot of money and he would probably get another job very quickly. Uh, Brad is a very intelligent guy. And I would have thought that he's played a number of scenarios out when he joined the Toronto Maple Leafs, including okay, where's this team this year? Where do I see it in three years? Right. So um, I, I don't think he's 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 shocked that they aren't considered uh, one of the top teams right now in the in the National Hockey League. So I, I think he's he's weighed out a couple of scenarios and maybe maybe he's had a uh, maybe he's been reassured by somebody above him that, you know, we're not signing you to let you go in two years. Right. Put it that way. Okay. Last question. When Mitch Marner speaks the way he does 
after losses. Yeah. It's 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 nails on a chalkboard for me. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. And listen, I I'll never ap- apologize for being a Mitch Marner fan. I I got to coach this uh this kid uh who was smaller than everyone else in a prospects game when he was like 15 years old. And uh I saw the heart of a lion out there. Uh and uh there's no question that uh he's had a tremendous career also regarded one of the best Leafs in history with the the numbers that he's pushed put put up um but in saying that I didn't like what he said the other night too and I'd be the first one to tell him or anyone else that uh but it comes from a, a level of frustration and uh you know he's just he can't bring that much emotion uh, uh to a microphone after a game and uh you know he's he's been through a lot there's no question he's been through a lot through the media and uh you know a lot of things have happened including as we know being held at gunpoint i mean uh it it as much as the money's great for him uh it it hasn't been great uh sometimes uh outside of the rink so uh, i i get sometimes the frustration but he's got to take a deep breath and uh he's got to choose his words wisely so my question <laughs> is, do you think, because these guys all get training, they get it from the league, they get it from the team, they get it from the agent. Do you think he just doesn't listen? I'm not so sure about the, uh, the training, to be honest with you. Oh, really? Yeah. I, 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 I again, I, I don't, he doesn't strike me as a, a, a uncoachable kid. When you're coachable, you're coachable everywhere. And I, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what they're doing to him. And, you know, I mean, I know they got a PR department there, but I personally think that they can do a heck of a better job. Well, that's, that's shocking and disappointing. I would think that those guys, especially two of them, all of them would be getting both from the league, the union, their agents, yeah. Yeah. access to somebody that could help them prevent situations like that. I would think so too, but I don't get that impression. And maybe I'm wrong, but I do not get that impression. Well, it's uh, it's been a hell of a ride so far. We're only sitting here on January 20th, and what we got a month and change till the death. Like it was funny. The Leafs are here Sunday. When the Leafs came last time, I was at the Springsteen concert the night before, and the Euro the Euros were literally five rows in front of me having a great time until the next morning i think three of them got traded and it was quite the scene just before the deadline we're not at the deadline yet but here we sit be an interesting game tonight interesting game tomorrow not many games left before the deadline i i'm one of the few who's taken a lot of interest in the fact that the talking heads seem to be suggesting that brad has put the brakes on putting all of his chips in it's good to see you it's awesome to have you Hope we can yeah, do it again. It'll Certainly. it'll it'll be an interesting finish here. Like I said, a uh, bit of a fork in the road right now for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Can they string a few games uh, together here and get themselves back on track? And or are we having a different conversation again in a, in a week or two in terms of uh, being a sales uh, a salesman uh, at the trade deadline? Fun times either way, though, right? You can hear Nick on your radio dial, on your podcast dial, on your streaming dial, and on your TV. Are you still selling the, the booze? I see the booze over your over your shoulder. <laughs> oh yeah, little boot is still there. Uh, uh, where can people working... find where can people find it? Uh right now, uh we're in a bit of a transition period uh with Little Buddha, but uh we're hoping to get going again in the fall. Uh but it's in the US, it's in the Bahamas. Uh we got a little bit of uh little Buddha out west in, in Calgary. So uh, you know, uh it's it's been a wonderful ride, a wonderful learning experience uh, in the beverage industry. Well, it's as I said, it's your show's fantastic. It's a lot of fun to listen to. It's a great. Uh, we have a yin and a yang, if you will. We have two really good <laughs> programs, and I will say this: it's it's awesome that you guys hold everybody accountable, and that is that is unique sometimes in the marketplace. There's a lot of people that like to sing praise all the time, and life isn't always. Uh, what do they say gumdrops and lollipops and uh, that is a breath of fresh air so to you and your team thank you and thank you for doing this and i hope we can have you again in the press row enjoyed it thank you
Thank you for listening to today's episode of In the Press Row with Nick Kiprios. Hope that uh, satiated your hockey and media talk. So much exciting stuff going on. Nick originally said that uh, he only wanted to stick around for 30 minutes. We were blessed to have him for a full hour. Covered a ton of ground. Uh, lots of sound bites there. Things that I'm sure you haven't heard on his show. It's going to be an interesting. Uh, we'll see how bumpy or smooth it is the rest of the way. Uh, really enjoy having you here. As always, if you would like to appear on the press row or if you have questions, you can reach me on all of your social media platforms. I am at YYZ Sports Media. You can reach me at Jonah at YYZ Sports Media.com. Please subscribe on all of your podcast streaming channels or here on YouTube. And until next time, this is Jonah from Seattle in the press row.